This is uh, Peter O'Rourke with the National Alliance for Public Safety, GIS Foundation, and thank you for participating in this um, uh, virtual training series. We're really fortunate today to have um, some experts on wildland search and rescue, our friends from MAPSAR, who MAPSIG has had a great relationship with over the, the past few years. Um, we'll go through a non-technical training today, and at the end of the session, we'll show you some uh, training modules that are available for you to um, watch and download at your at your leisure. Um, so without further ado, what we'll do is start off and I'll introduce Paul Doherty from Esri and John Petter and, uh, from MAPSAR, and John and Paul can um, uh, start us off and walk us through the training today. Uh, Paul, over to you. Good morning, everybody. I just want to say a couple of quick words to thank John and the Sierra Madre SAR team uh, for all they've done here. As you probably read up on, this is a volunteer initiative. Um, using GIS for search and rescue really wasn't uh, a widespread thing. Um, four or five years ago, I was sitting in the, the bottom of Yosemite Valley, asked to do uh, GIS for search and rescue, and when I turned to the internet, I found one single white paper, and I felt very alone. So. It's really exciting to see this, uh, this template come out for GIS users and for people who, uh, who maybe never thought they wanted to learn GIS to really be able to um, learn GIS for a real skill to, to do search and rescue. So what you'll see today is really just a small piece of what GIS can do for search and rescue, but it's really the best place to start. And I think that um, what John has put together and with the help of NAPSIG, this will be a really smooth transition for, for most of you to go from your normal GIS duties to, uh, to search and rescue. And again, just a reminder, this is all a volunteer initiative. I know that funding is tight in all of your departments across public safety agencies, but this is a, this is a bottom up thing. And so I'm really excited to, to see where this goes. And I count on all of you as a community, a real call to action to, to continue to work with this group and to, uh, to make it even better. So with that, I'd like to introduce John Petter, the guy who spends way too much time coding Python to, uh, to bring this to you today. And uh, here you go, John. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you. So uh, this is going to be sort of the first in a series of, of webinars. Today is non-technical. Uh, so it's just an overview of what MAPSAR is, uh, how it came about, and uh, and, and how it works. And uh, as Peter suggested, we have some videos up online for some how-tos, um, which we'll point to you a little later. And that's an ongoing series of how-tos as well, and we're building those as we can. So, Stellar Public Safety, how, how can they benefit from using the GIS? Um, we've used paper maps for a long, long time. Uh, especially on search and rescue operations, and we still continue to use paper maps. Um, the idea is how do we get these paper maps produced accurately and quickly for use in our, in our rescue operations. Uh, that's how MAPSAR came about, was a way to produce these maps quickly and accurately and get them into the hands of the searchers. Uh, MAPSAR started off just as a map printing product and has uh, grown a little bit more uh, now to start managing some of the uh, actions throughout a SAR. And with that, we used uh, the core ICS model um, and followed that as, as, as much as we could throughout, throughout this, uh, this data model so it fits in with, uh, with standards. So maps are the key to the missions. Um, what really happened was we would, uh, as, as a team, Sierra Madre Search and Rescue team would respond to a mutual aid calls out of our area. We'd get there and then sit around waiting to get our assignments. How do we get this done quicker and better? That's where we came across um, ArcMap and started to look at that as a product to see how we could use that make maps quicker and get us into the field faster. Once loaded with data, we found that the GIS is actually a very good, quick tool to create these maps, get them out into the field, and, uh, and then track the actions that are happening on those assignments in the field. 
so um, we've got uh, resource time management and, and how best to utilize those resources and why use MAPSAR to do this. MAPSAR is a data model which is already built with the modules for search and rescue. So we have assignments, we have modules for clues, uh, for tracks, for tracking what happened during the, during the incident. And that's the benefit to MAPSAR, is it's already a data model that has been created that you can use now as an empty template to populate your data. You don't have to go reinvent the wheel every time a new incident comes up and spin up something different. You can use this same empty model, populate it with data, and use it uh, very quickly and easily to manage the incident. Because it's a standard uh, model, other people know how to use this model. So when you have a SAR that lasts many days and you need additional resources to come in, um, you can't keep just burning out JS folks. So you can pull people in that understand and, and know the MAPSAR model and they can plug right into your, into your operation. So it makes, uh, it makes running multi-day uh, and bigger operations uh, much easier using a standard model than recreating the wheel each time. So with uh, GIS, we use the editing templates considerably uh, to build and create our assignments. Everything is a geospatial problem uh, when it comes to search and rescue. And when you look at ArcMap, basically, it's a big drawing program. And you can draw shapes on the screen, which just happen to have uh, you no know, real geospatial relation underneath. And that's what an assignment is, uh, or a search segment. When you're breaking a map up into pieces uh, for where you want to send your search teams, you're just drawing on the screen on, on top of a base map where you want these teams to go. So we created a full set of, uh, of features to populate for assignments. So when you draw these assignments on the screen, you can now populate that assignment with the information like where do you want these people to search? What do you want them to do? What assignment number is it? what operational period was that um, assignment created in. Now the team goes off out into the field with their map of the assignment that you drew, and now you can monitor the progress of that assignment. Has that assignment found any clues? Uh, is that assignment completed? Is the assignment got abandoned? What is the status of that assignment? What happened to your crews while they're on the assignment? Are they in the field? Are they still searching? Is it done? So we've created um, a tie to tie all the assignment piece, all the pieces of a SAR back to an assignment. So if you have assignment number one that's getting executed, any clues found throughout that assignment are tied back to assignment number one in that operational period. So it's a really good way to track and uh, and consolidate all the information that goes on with the assignment. We can also produce um, reports, briefing maps, status maps, update maps. Uh, we have templates for all those throughout the system. Found that uh, when running an incident, if you're in GIS, it can sometimes be a little hard to get the data from the folks running the incident. But if you're able to produce to provide data back in the form of reports and maps that they can actively use and are useful to them, you'll find that uh, the GIS person will get fed a lot more data. So again, it's, um, keeping everything in the model, it keeps everything in a single place, easy to, easy to track, easy to reproduce, easy to store. So what sort of makes up maps are is, um, first of all, ArcMap, which is you know, the product from ESRI. Um, it's generally a pretty expensive piece of software, but Esri uh, supports the SAR missions very, very, very well. They've uh, created a program specific for nonprofits um, so that we can get software um, for free from ESRI by applying um, on the Esri website as a SAR team, as a registered nonprofit. So they'll support you as far as getting the software. So where price used to be a bit of an issue and folks would use other products because of the price problem, um, that's gone away. So thank you very much to Esri for supporting us doing that and allowing people to run this map style model um, very inexpensively, if not free. So, and um, MAPSAR is a series, it's a database 
with a series of templates, map templates, and also a series of add-ins. And the add-ins, as uh, Paul suggested earlier, are a lot of scripts written in Python, which automate a lot of the workflows and a lot of the complex workflows, which made the adoption of MapSAR difficult to start with. Uh, we've built a lot of new tools uh, to quickly make maps and produce information, which before were you know, five to 10 step processes, we've automated down now to, to the click of a button. And it makes it so much easier for a lay uh, GIS person to run uh, this model. We've, uh, we've got a training manual, which is available on our website. It's, uh, it needs a bit of an update right now. Um, this was version 1.3, and we're up to 1.6 at this point. Um, so we do need to update the training manuals, but we do have webinars um, available online, and we have videos available online um, to help you uh, adopt the software product. This is an image of, of one of MapSAR's templates. At the top, you'll see the custom toolbar. What we've done is taken a lot of the tools that ESRI has and simplify it down to a, a subset of tools that we've found useful during SAR operations. Um, ESRI has an amazing amount of toolbars within the product, and uh, we just you know, called them out, condensed it down, and uh, it's the toolbar you're seeing here, um, highlighted in orange, is a mixture of native ESRI tools plus the buttons which are custom for MAPSA, which we've created. On the left is all the layers associated with the incident, and we just have a screenshot of a map with uh, a point last seen in the center of it. This is one of many templates. Uh, I think the system has uh, close to 25 templates in it now, uh, different sizes of map, different styles of map, and for different uses of map. So what's different about um, GIS and using GIS as opposed to some other products um, for tracking information is that the, the symbols on the map have information behind them. So on this page, you're seeing in the square one and a circle. And the circle is our symbol for a clue. One is the number of that clue, it was the first clue, so the next one would have clue two, clue three, clue four, et cetera. But beneath that circle, in the attribute by dialog box to the right, you can see all this information that's associated with that uh, symbol on the map. So we know if it's a relevant clue, again, what assignment it ties back to, which team found it, when they found it, where they found it, and the location of it. So these clues now are stored in a database and centrally managed and accessible. So when you've got a large number of clues or a large number of information on the map, you can see it's symbolized, but you've actually got real data that you can print out in reports and manage underneath each one of these symbols. So in ArcMap and, and through MapSAR, everything is in a layer, and all these layers are just showing what information you need. Um, being able to turn on and off layers really simplifies things. It can, de it can declutter your map greatly uh, from a, a regular hand-drawn map that you might have clues and post-its and uh, people with markers that have drawn on the map, and two or three days later, they get pretty messy and difficult to read. Storing it all in the database, you only need to show the data that you want to show. It's, everything is um, able to be hidden or shown, and you can, uh, you can make custom custom queries to only show what you want throughout the throughout the, uh, the whole model. So we print maps and we print assignment maps, which are the maps that the teams take into the field with them. Uh, generally, either letter, legal, uh, or tabloid size um, has all the information associated with the assignment for the team, so they've got everything on one piece of paper. Uh, we also make, uh, have templates for briefing maps and planning maps. Um, you can create uh, maps for your PIO for management with the media, logistics and operational maps. And we have uh, several templates in there, uh, pre-designed, pre but they're all customizable. Uh, you can go in and if you have specific needs for your team or your specific search that you're on, you can open the template and just customize it any way you need. Um, so we've given you a base set to start with, but by no means are they fixed in place. This is a completely open model 
So you can take any of these templates and customize them for your own need uh, as you see fit per incident, or you can customize them to your local area. Uh, John. Yes. So, uh, Peter, we have a question. I, I think I know the answer, but I'd like to ask the question and you can answer it. Um, this is from Louisiana. Are the MAPSAR templates available to non-MAPSAR users, for example, data providers? Uh, these templates and the whole data model is made available freely to anyone that wants it. Um, we have, on our website, you can download it. You just fill out a simple questionnaire, who you are, where you're from, and you can download this model uh, for free, and anybody can use it, and we'll assist anybody get up and running with it. Great. Thanks a lot. Welcome. So all the data that you need is something that you need to collect yourselves um, early on. Um, when you open up MAPSAR, it's a blank sheet of paper. You need to find your, your local data. Uh, we call it minimum essential data set. We won't spend a lot of time on it here, uh, but if you go to the MAPSAR.net website, there's a book using GIS for Wildland Search and Rescue ebook, which is a free download. If you download that, there's a very, very good, uh, thoroughly written, informative section on gathering your data. So that would be your base maps, it would be your trail information, roads, uh, streams, etc. Where do I find that? How do I put it together? How do I get this information for my local area? It's really something you want to do up front. Uh, it's nothing that you want to try and do if you have a search tomorrow. Uh, you know, trying to get that data together today would be quite challenging unless you know exactly where to find it. Um, so I do encourage everyone to download the book uh, written by Vanessa and George. Um, go through it, and it's a very, very good intro to using GIS and uh, managing data. That said, um, what you want to do is get all this, all this data together. And some of it you can accumulate from other sources and some you can create yourself. So if you have uh, a lot of local knowledge, local data, um, you can actually create that yourself. If you have wildland, hellespots, et cetera, that might not be available but from any other means, you can create your own layers, save this as your base data, so you can have that available for your local area. One th also thing you want to do is you want to make sure you keep everything up to date. Things change. Um, you want to make sure you keep all your data up to date and together so that you've got a grab and go bag for when these operations happen. You want to make sure it's portable. Where we normally do our job is no internet. You're lucky to have a cell phone reception in a lot of these areas too. So while the online maps are really, really good and they're easy to get and easy to use, they might not be available to you when you're on scene for a SAR. So I would recommend everyone creates their own little portable hard drive full of data that goes with you on any incident, and uh, you keep that up to date and ready to roll. So who needs to manage all this stuff, and why do we need MAPSAR to do it? On here is a couple of screenshots. Um, the lower left is uh, a search that was uh, in Southern California. Those are shown are aerial track log tracks. So these are helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft who are carrying GPSs, and uh, they were being placed on the map, and it's made a giant pile of looks like spaghetti pasta. Having that in a GIS and then having it in a data model like maps are enables you to filter what information you want to see on the map. Looking at that, it's not a very useful map at all. But if you can distill out more useful information, which particular aircraft flew on which days, um, what search patterns were flown, and being able to turn that on and off and produce reports about it is really an essential on, a, on an incident that's lasting many days or weeks. So looking at that map there, I say it's not very useful, but having it in our database, you can, you can carve out exactly what you need to produce the, the information for the next operational period. On the top there is a, a map uh, that was a search that happened in, uh, in Yosemite, and that's a typical hand search map. You'll see that it's got post-it stuck on it. It's got a bunch of hand-drawn scroll on it. It's got a small map stuck to the bottom. So the post-it falls off the wall and it falls onto the floor and it's gone. That post-it may have had a clue on it. 
may have had information about a footprint or a shoe that was found or some other useful piece of information, and that post-it's now gone. It got swept up into the trash, and the cleaning crew took it away. Having that data stored in a database, centrally managed, make sure that clue, once found, once recorded into the database, stays there and is maintained and is accessible. You do not want the search ending badly because you've you dropped a clue or dropped some information. Then you can take a map like that that was started off and drawn and hand-drawn originally, and then we can take that and for operational period two, we can actually digitize that and get going with the information that we've already got. So even if you start an, inf uh, start an operation off by hand drawing things, it can still be caught up to speed with the, with the data model and the information can be plugged in for your next operational period. So talking about when do we break out maps are. Um, we found that we don't generally spin it up a lot very often during the first day. Most of our searches in our local area, we resolve fairly quickly within hours, if not the first operational period, the search normally resolves itself. We found that we've found our subject. I probably haven't even opened my laptop at this point and, and done anything about getting maps up and running or digitizing anything. Our, our team, as your team does, they know your local area very well. Um, you don't need to produce specific maps and specialized maps for your local search teams uh, for a local incident. But now, you're not finding the person in the first operational period, say the first 12 hours, and things are starting to come. You need to bring teams in from outside, mutual aid teams that don't know your area. You need to provide maps for those folks. Um, you need to provide assignments for all those folks to do when they come in. So if they've driven all night to get to you, when they arrive in the morning, you want to hand them off maps and get them out and running with those uh, assignments that, uh, that your plans have come up with overnight. That's when you really want to have um, maps are up and running. Now we found it really good practice, even if you don't need it, if you've got the time available during that first operation period, open it up, break it out, start a new incident, get familiar with it, make sure that when the big search comes, you're not scrambling wondering how to do things anymore because you haven't opened your laptop up in, in months. So while we don't necessarily use it always in the first period, we try and spin it up whenever we can, uh, get that base data populated, get the information in there. So if we do start going to a second or third or fourth operational period, we're already ahead of the game. We're not playing good catch up all we, as much as we need to. Now the search is done and we're finished and we're gonna debrief. Having all that information in one place in one database, uh, incredibly useful for the, for the debrief. You can walk through the clues that were found the assignments that were done. Um, plans can discuss why they did, what they did, and how they did it. So it's a very good tool for doing it, not immediately after the search, but a year later. You can, rather than going through a box of maps that you might have had, um, you know, hand-drawn maps, you can just unpack the database, and you can review this, uh, you know, six months, a year later if you need to. So, we got the ICS, of, um, which we talked a little bit about earlier. So we've got plans. So plans is uh, sitting up with the, with the GIS, looking at what assignments they want, uh, they want to get done, looking at the map, deciding where they want to draw these assignments, and getting that done. Um, plans can hand draw these on, on paper maps and hand them off to the GIS specialist, or you might have some plans folks who are uh, technically savvy enough to create their own um, and quite frankly, if you sit with someone for a few minutes and then give them a mouse and a drawing tool, within 10 minutes they can start drawing assignments or search segments on these maps. Uh, so these guys get all their um, assignments into place and then we get them all printed out and, uh, and ready to go. We can also take these assignments and load them onto GPSs. Uh, at present, we're spitting out KML files, which um, can be used to upload to uh, GPS units. Uh, we're working currently on uh, GPX files as well and being able to produce GPX files of the assignments. So if you're giving somebody a, an assignment, you can give them a paper map. You can also upload it into their GPS. So when they're out in the field, they can vi visibly see on their GPS where they are and what the boundaries of their areas are. It's also useful 
if you want to shift somebody from one assignment to another assignment, and they may not have a paper map, but on their GPS they might have that assignment listed so you can walk them physically in the field from one assignment to the next by having that uh, information on their GPS unit. So we start a briefing. Um, the briefing might be when you've got new teams arriving and you need to give them an update on the situation. Briefing could be for uh, the media. The briefing could be for the family. Uh, you might need different maps showing different data for each of these. Uh, again, just being able to turn that data on and off and expose only that data that's useful to you for that particular uh, map use is another really good reason to have everything in one database. Uh, the media, you may want to you know, carve out some information and provide them specific uh, information, not all of it, whereas your search crews might be one much more detail when they come in for their, for their briefing. During the operations, we use MAPSAR to track status of what's going on. By tracking the status, we're talking about call teams calling in on the radio. Where are they at? What are they doing? What is the team status? Have they found something useful? Where are they in their assignment? They're generally calling in coordinates and saying, hi, this is team two, a coordinate X, Y, and we're doing this. Uh, or it's team two at X, Y, and we found a shoe. This information gets plugged into the, uh, into the database immediately and is immediately available to the folks in ops and the folks in plans to see visually on the map what's going on, what's happening. Do we, do we find uh, relevant information that needs us to start moving things around, moving teams around in the field? So we're using MAPSAR operationally to manage our teams and also keep our teams safe. If we have teams... Um, Overnight in the field, we, those are teams we really want to track on and keep and, and keep track of. So in the morning, we're going to check on everybody, uh, and make sure that everybody's accounted for. Then we're using MAPSAR to to put together all these pieces as well. Uh, we have a debrief module, so when teams come back from the field, um, they've completed their assignment, we can now debrief them and store that information and associate it with the assignment. Now, did that assignment need to be searched again? Was it really brushy? Was it a tough assignment? Uh, what's the team's feeling on that? All the information that you get back um, from a team when they come into the field, we plug in and we update the assignment status. So now the status on the map, uh, which we're using in, in the CP, you can visually see which assignments have been completed, which assignments are still outstanding and need to be done, which assignments are assigned and are actively being searched. And it makes managing the areas that you're searching much easier than just having half a dozen paper maps, uh, again, with uh, you know, hand-drawn scroll on it. Then in the, another period, you're going to get back, you're going to regroup and sort out all the data that came in during the day, and plans gets going again, and the whole cycle starts. So we've got the, the operational planning, ops, briefing, updates for media, updates for family, updates for team, and it's just an, a, a cycle that continues until our subject is found. So when you first uh, open MAPSAR up and you start a new incident, the first thing we need to do is understand where we're searching. So we have the ability to drop a point last seen or a last known point or initial planning point on the map to center our search around. Once we've done that, we can now describe our incident, describe our subject. And this, some of this might not be spatial data, but it's data that we want to keep in the database and keep together and store all in the same place. So this might be information about our subject, his name, what's he wearing, what, is he, what does he like to do? Is he a hiker, a runner, um, a jogger? What kind of tent does he have? All this information that you might normally have written on a notepad gets put into the database in addition to the notepad. So you've got it, again, stored in one central repository. You've also got information maybe on your RPs. So who reported him missing? What's their phone number? What's their information? Again, it's not really spatial information, but it's information related to the incident that's useful to, con to consolidate all into one single place. So we've, we've got our, our point last seen on the map, or our initial planning point. We can now quickly center a map right around that point and print any size. We have maps, uh, templates available all the way from letter up to anti-E size maps. Uh, so you can produce a, a pretty good size map very quickly. 
again, we talked about creating the team assignment maps, and then we've also got team assignment forms. They're based on loosely on an ICS 204 form. Um, they don't exactly follow uh, the form, but they're very close, and we can print those out uh, at simultaneously as printing assignment maps. So you can press the print, print map button, select that I want to print assignments 1, 7, 9, and 12, press go, and it's going to immediately create PDFs of both the, t of the ma assignment maps with the assignment centered and the task form associated with that. So the task form will have all the information about the assignment, including team members, uh, comms information, frequencies, radios, et cetera, safety brief information, and you're done. We've chosen to print the, the maps to PDF and not directly to a printer. It's for several reasons. One is that we can now store them. So if you need to have another copy of that map printed later on, you can easily do so without having to recreate it. You've got the PDF. The second one is if you're in a remote location that may not have a plotter or a printer available, you can now hand these off to someone on a, on a stick. They can disappear in the car for half an hour and come back with maps that they've printed in a different location. So we found that's the best way to do it is to create uh, PDFs rather than tie up and try and print everything directly from the product. The biggest, uh, the biggest thing that we focused on throughout the whole product is quick map production, quick accurate map production to get the teams out there into the field because that's where we're going to find people is boots on the ground, people in the field. So during the incident, Again, we monitor the operations that's going on. We update the assignments, so that's the status of the assignments. We uh, update the clues, what clues are found in the field. And reports are something I've found incredibly useful, is uh, be able to hand off to operations or plans a list of all the assignments that have been created, a list of the status on those assignments, a list of all the clues, a list of what teams are in the field right now. and. Uh, when they ask for these reports, we have uh, probably 15 to 20 report templates which are available, and you can quickly just open a report template up and pop a report straight out for, for up ops or for plans or whoever needs it. And again, I found that when you can provide information back to those you're seeking information from, there's a much better data exchange that goes on. Assigning the search areas and the search assignments, as I discussed earlier, uh, it's as simple as drawing shapes on a map. Uh, if you have a good base map and you have your good base data and you can use a map to draw, uh, to draw images on a screen, you can use this product to draw search assignments and draw uh, search segments however you wish to manage it. We do have uh, some modules in there for tracking teams and team members. So we, can, uh, we know which teams are in the field. Uh, what teams are available, what teams are not available, but also now we can track what those teams did. So you could look up Team 7 and say, what assignments did Team 7 do? What clues did Team 7 find? You can also do vice versa. You can look at clue number 12, who found that? I need to talk to that person again. So now you can look at that clue, which is associated with an assignment, which was associated with a team. So you, when you need to go back and talk to somebody about uh, just getting some more information about something, it's all tracked easily and you're not scrambling to find out who did what because we've got everything consolidated by assignment number. Loading and collecting data from GPSs, um, we've chosen to do not collect data directly into maps are. A um, couple reasons for this. Uh, the biggest is that when you get team members back out of the field and you've got, say, three or four teams that arrived and you've got 15 GPSs in a row, the last thing we want to do is tie up the GIS specialist and the machine that they're running on, downloading and trying to sort out GPS data. Inevitably, someone hasn't cleared their track log and they've got you know, the whole drive to the incident on there as well, which needs to be cleaned up before, you, before it's usable to you on the incident. So we've chosen to use some other tools for that. And uh, common tools are Terrain Navigator Pro. Um, Garmin Basecamp, we like. It's a free download. It's, uh, it's very easy to use and very easy to clean up those tracks in. And DNR Garmin, another very good, useful tool. So we've chosen to have people elsewhere on other laptops 
manage the download and the collection of this data. Then it can be handed off on a memory stick or a network if you're lucky enough to be in a networked environment. And uh, we have a custom tool within MAPSAR to uh, load all these GPX uh, files into our incident. And they load in as tracks. So those tracks now can be associated with the assignment that they came from, which again associates back to the team, which associates back to any clues that were found, which associates back to who did it and what they did. So by uh, enabling us to pull in this GPX and these, uh, these track log information, uh, both points and, and polys, we can track the, uh, the status of what people did, when they did it, how they did it, and who did it. So once the search is done, we, I said that we, can, we can debrief this. There might be a lot of media materials uh, that need to be produced, especially on a very public or publicized search incident uh, that's, that's hit the press. Uh, it may be that we need to also talk to the family about somebody that didn't get found. Having all this information in one place and being able to produce comprehensive maps showing the extent and scope of a search that may not have had a successful conclusion is a really good for the family to understand the amount of work that went into looking for their loved one. It's also good on the, on the other end when you do have a successful search and the media wants to know how many miles did you search, what did you do, how did it work, uh, how did you find him, where were they found. And again, you can produce uh, very succinct maps very quickly, easily, with only the data that you choose to, to display, uh, both family, media, and debrief. At the end of this incident, you can just zip it up. You can use uh, any, any of the built-in utilities, zip it up, put it on a disk, and store it. You've now got an archive of what happened on this incident. So uh, a year from now, if you need to bring out a training and learn something or uh, figure out what you did well on this incident or what you could have done better, you can easily unzip everything and display exactly what happened, the progress that happened through each operational period, uh, through each assignment and what went well and what didn't went well. So it's good from a training perspective and an archival perspective uh, to go through that. Um, maps are, can be localized to wherever you need to and in whatever datum that, and coordinate system that you prefer. If you're uh, UTM and you use UTM for most of your ground search, that's great. You can choose to do that and, uh, and localize it in any datum you want. If you're a US National Grid, no problem. Just go ahead and choose US, US National Grid, and we can, uh, we can have that in there too. If you want it that long, um, we can localize this all over the world. Uh, we've got some folks in Australia right now in GDA 94, Zone 55, that we're, we're localizing. So we have um, built-in tools. So when you download MAPSAR, it comes uh, just with a null spatial uh, reference system, and you apply whatever it is for your own local, uh, local area. There's a little how-to document to walk you through. It takes about uh, 10 or 15 minutes after your initial download just to create a localized version for you, and now you have version for your team localized. If you're on the edge of UTM zones, make yourself you know, two, or three, whatever you need, with different coordinate systems and uh, localize it for your own area. So again, uh, no internet. So the uh, the base data, the, the uh, minimal essential data set. Again, I suggest you just download the ebook, go through George and Vanessa's module there on collecting data, where to find it, how to find it. That's the best way to get that set up. Some of the other things. Uh, that you might not think about is you have a laptop that's been sitting in your bag, in your go bag for a month, for two months, and you haven't opened it. Now you open it and get ready to start an incident. Lo and behold, Microsoft is uh, sitting there with 87 updates waiting to be applied to your laptop, which is going to take the best part of an hour. And your laptop's unusable until Microsoft applies all these updates. 
So break out that laptop frequently. Make sure that you've got those Microsoft updates in place. Make sure that the battery's decent on it. Make sure you've got your printer. Make sure that the ink is good in your printer, that someone hasn't stolen the paper. Um, it's really simple things, but when you're in a search and you need to get out of here quickly and deploy to a search, it's the small things that can end up with the gotchas. So keep all your equipment in good order and make sure it's ready to roll. Uh, we talked about the reasons that we don't do uh, print direct printing, that we print to PDFs. One is because, again, you can, you can reproduce them days after, and two is because you can transport them. We've found that if we've been in an area without a plotter, you can always find one somewhere. Fire departments have them, some of the forest services have them. You can take a couple PDFs down there and you can get these things printed out. So keep your stuff ready to go, ready to deploy, and uh, it'll be in much better shape when it's actually needed. So next steps for folks here are go and get the software. Uh, it's pretty easy. We can, we've got it up on mapsar.net. Um, you can just download it for free there. There's also a video there called Life Saving Maps. It's about a seven minute video. Um, it'll give you a really good overview of the creation of maps are, where it came from, the people's inputs that, uh, that came into the design of this product. Um, remote support is available. You can email us. Um, several of us get uh, the assistance and support emails. If you've got an actual incident that you need help on, ask for help. We'll be more than happy to help remotely. Uh, or if it's uh, local to us, we'll be happy to come out and, and help in person. Um, I've actually assisted in many searches from, from my home where I can't get there, but I can still produce maps, process data, import GPS data for people, uh, share it via Dropbox, share it via email. So remote support and uh, allowing people to collaborate remotely is pretty easy to do. We have um, a super Google, Google group, which is worth joining, um, which Paul put together. Um, and there's also some online training at ESRI for folks that need to get up and running on, on uh, GIS. There's a series of, um, of videos that we're putting together right now on how to use MAPSAR. Um, they're little snippet videos, so it might be how to start a new incident, how to place a clue on a map, how to, start, how to put a PLS on a map, how to print a map. And those are an ongoing process. We've got, I think, 20 videos at present, and uh, we're slowly adding to those. They're on YouTube right now. Um, NAPSIG will have them up on their site very shortly, and especially after the revamp of their site, they'll be available uh, online there. Uh, bottom right picture with all the dots on it are folks that are all within our SAR GIS group. So we've got people all over the world. We've got people in Europe, people in Australia, people up in Canada. Uh, South America, all in on this group, interested in GIS for search and rescue, and all collaborating uh, on these yeah, on the Google group. So I do encourage you to join. So resources for for folks right here, Mapsar.net. Uh, that's where you can download um, Mapsar data model, uh, the ebook that Vanessa and George have on GIS and search and rescue. There's a training manual there for Mapsar and uh, also the help at mapsar.net address if, if you need to reach out for assistance. YouTube, um, that shows uh, the, uh, the how-to videos. Again, that's where they're hosted right now. The Wildland uh, SAR blog um, that Paul's got there and the SAR GIS uh, Google group, uh, all very, very good and useful information. And that is what I have uh, from me today. So open Excellent. for questions. Open for questions. Yeah. Thanks, John. We've got a few questions. Um, first, the easy one. What version of ArcMap is currently in use? Uh, 10.1. Uh, we support version 10.1. 10.2 uh, is almost supported. It will definitely be supported by November. Um, but we're working on a couple of issues uh, within MapSAR to see if we can get it 10.2 supported. But 10.1 is the current, current working version. Okay. You do have an ArcMap. Uh, next Next question, are you able to create and work with a Geo PDF for those who have that product? From yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Geo PDFs are produced, um, when we produce our, our, G, our, our PDF files, they are automatically set to that, to that, uh, that type. So they are Geo PDFs when you produce them. 
Great. Uh, next question is, we uh, have talked about a lot of space and indirectly time. Are the templates time-enabled? Does MAPSAR take advantage of the ability of ArcGIS to analyze and visualize time-enabled geospatial features? At this time, it is not. We did look into uh, starting this and, and actually time-enabling, especially some of the clues layers, uh, so that you could play back when clues were found, uh, when things were done. At this time, we haven't enabled the time, but it's definitely on the feature request list to happen. Yeah, tell us okay. what you're looking for and we can build it. Yeah, I mean, if you've got feature requests specific, uh, drop us a line, ask for it, and uh, we'll talk it through and see if it fits what we need. And, and if it does, we'll, we'll try and incorporate it into the next release. Great. Uh, next question, how does MapStar support higher level spatial analysis in the planning section? Um, all the tools that are built into ArcGIS are absolutely available to you. So depending whatever uh, tools that you wish to run on your raster sets are all available uh, within the product um, because we, we're not removing anything. We're just limit, we're not limiting access to anything. So if you want to run a slope analysis uh, or add some of that information in DEMs or you want to uh, add uh, you know, ground cover and do some analysis on ground cover, all the default tools throughout the product, uh, which is ArcMap, are still available to you. Great. Uh, next question would be, um, sorry, okay, if you have a pre-segmented, if you have pre-segmented your agency's area prior to a SAR event, when a SAR does start, can you then subdivide the pre-segments to meet the needs of the SAR? Sure. Uh, again, that's um, sort of functionality within, uh, within ArcMap itself. So if you have a segment which you've drawn, and you just need to break that poly up into two or three, uh, you can use just the default drawing tools that come with editor and the editing templates to do that and break them up. Um, if you want to pre-segment, you can do it a couple of ways. You can pre-segment and uh, just save those as a layer and then be able to just load the layer in, or you can actually create yourself a data model template uh, which is populated with not only segments, but you can populate that with your trails, with your local data, and zip that up so that when that incident comes in that area, you can open it, you can have access to your segments, your data, your trails, everything in one, one quick unzipping action. Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, are there any teams integrating real-time tracking of team locations with MAPSAR, uh, ArcGIS? Uh, talking about using things like handheld radio-based GPS tools, et cetera. I know that there are some teams that have looked into it and, I, and have done some work with GIS and the real-time tracking on the radios. I don't know that we've, they've done an integration with MAPSAR specifically, but I know that with ArcMap. Paul, do you know anything more about that? Yeah, so there's tools for uh, real-time GPS radio tracking. And there's also tools for satellite, uh, or we call them send devices, satellite uh, notification devices. So uh, Delorm, InReach, and also Spot. Uh, there's a community around building tools for that to import into ArcMap as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, as we look to mobile devices in the future, uh, that'll be supported through the ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Online collector uh, in the future. So I think those are, those are a couple of options there. Great. Um, and then, uh, John, I know you touched on National Grid and that long. Uh, one question is, what coordinate system is most commonly used or recommended? Um, <laughs> it, it, it depends where your search and rescue team is, quite honestly. Um, the yeah. national parks are NAT, are NAT 83, and uh, generally coordinates by ground field teams are, are communicated in UTM. So we generally use NAT 83 UTM and localize it to whichever UTM zone uh, we need to work in. But it's completely up to the user. What their team does and how they need to run their op is how you can localize MAPSAR to fit your needs. Um, we will be, say, we, we distribute it openly to be able to put it into whatever datum you need to do, um, special reference you need to accommodate. Thanks. Um, looks like we have at least one more question. Uh, does the data model support linear referencing um, polyline M features? 
linear referencing. Um, I'm not quite sure what is meant. Can that be? Can you expand on that Jim, a little bit more? Yeah, Jim, can you give us some more any more detail on that? I think he's streaming, so I can't bring him into the actual audio. Um, in the meantime, uh, can everybody see my screen? Uh, John and Paul, do you see my screen right now? Yes, I do. Okay, great. So for the folks on the call, uh, as John referenced, uh, MAPSIG has posted some of the shorter training modules on MAPSAR. Uh, so if you go to the MAPSIG um, uh, YouTube channel, which is just search YouTube, Ma YouTube MAPSIG Foundation, you'll see um, right here we have the list of these um, uh, short training modules posted. We will have them available on our uh, website a little bit later on. Uh, we're doing a refresh and an update of the website, and it just at this point makes sense to wait for that. But they are available um, right now, today, live on the MAPSIG website, MAPSIG, I'm sorry, YouTube channel, uh, and look for it very soon on the website. Uh, so just a clarification on the linear referencing. Um, it's from from a DOT, so I think it might be the DOT vernacular. Things like uh, mile points along a highway is what he's suggesting. Oh, um, absolutely. Um, we've got – you can either create your own layers, et cetera, for that data. Um, if you've got a highway where you need to do you know, reference car overs or uh, you need to you know, have mile markers on there. We've also um, got a point layer called scratch points and a line layer, scratch lines. And the, the scratch just implies you can use them for anything you wish. Um, there's an attribute table associated with that. But within the ArcMap products, you can create any data you wish like that. Uh, you can collect it maybe on a GPS if you wanted to and go out and waypoint on the GPS and then uh, put it into a layer. But it's all very, very doable, not only just within um, uh, MapsR, but just within the ArcMap product. Okay, excellent. Um, it looks like that is it for questions. Uh, what I'll do quickly is just also show you the NAPSIG website, um, the old version, which should be updated soon. But if you look under latest news here, which I'm hi highlighting, um, we will post the um, this recording. And John, if it's okay with you, we've had some folks ask if we could post the PDF of your slides. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll post both the recording and the PDF of the slides. Um, that should be available in the next couple hours. Um, we just need to do the downloading from WebEx. Um, so it looks like, with that being said, we are uh, at the end of the webinar, and the recording will end soon. But I wanted to thank you, John, for um, and Paul and Arnold for all the work you guys did in having this take place. Um, a great effort. The, the training modules were actually up to 29 that are posted on the YouTube site. Um, and we're going to have more posted. That's just a great level of effort and cooperation between uh, MAPSAR and Esri, so thank you guys for that. And um, thank you mostly for the folks who have participated on this uh, on a Saturday uh, and on a Yom Kippur, so we're an official apology for NAPSIG for not paying attention to the religious calendar. Um, but thank you, everybody, and we will be um, ending the recording now.